The UK has left the, the institutions as it wanted to. Um, the UK no longer has MEPs, there is no longer a European Commissioner, there are no longer any ministers in the Council of Ministers. But for a while, and until the end of 2020 this year, this was a decision that was taken two years ago, so in fact the transition period which should have been two years and is now only ten months, the, the, the UK will remain in the single market and the customs union and benefit from all uh, European policies as well as be bound by their obligations. So the two-year, now ten-month uh, transition period is very serious because the British Prime Minister has told us and told us again and again uh, that, the will, that he will not request any extension uh, to the transition period, which of course is possible, um, and he would like that transitional period to end at the end of this December. So on the 31st of December, regardless of what happens, the United Kingdom will also leave the single market and the customs union. And this is what Mr Johnson also repeated to Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, with all of the consequences that will stem from that. So we have to make the best possible use of the short period that we have in front of us, first of all, to properly implement the withdrawal agreement and make sure that's precise and rigorous. This is a, really a question of trust. We've signed and ratified, it, ratified an international treaty. It needs to be properly in, implemented in all of its provisions. And, of course, with particular attention paid to Ireland. We also need to prepare ourselves for what will happen on the 31st of December because regardless of, of what we uh, agree between now and then, there will be definitive uh, changes, all goods coming from the UK, uh, just as they do from China or the United States, will need to be checked at the border of the single market to protect, of course, consumers and to protect businesses. So those checks will be put into place. The Netherlands have uh, recruited some 700 uh, customs officials, France a similar number, Belgium 400. And in that same time period, in that very short amount of time, we also need to conduct a second set of negotiations. Uh, and I, I spoke... Um, Yesterday, of course, with, with heads of state, uh, we now have a mandate which has been given to us by heads of state and by the parliament. Um, and the really what is at stake is unchanged. We still need to come to an agreement with the United Kingdom. It's going to be difficult, it's going to be complicated, and we don't have much time to do it. And, and to do this, we base ourselves on a on a document which goes hand in hand with the withdrawal agreement. You can see it here on the slide. It's the pillars of an ambitious partnership. And these, this was the wording agreed with uh, Boris Johnson. This is the political declaration which deals not just with economic issues, now I'll speak in English, uh, but also uh, about the security partnership. It's a partnership which goes much, much beyond uh, trade in goods. It needs to deal with services, investment, transport, energy. We also need to deal with future relationships between uh, European universities that we support in terms of research and development. We need to continue the Erasmus programme in some form of, of another. So these are the topics which are at the heart of the economic and social partnership. And then, of course, there's internal security and foreign policy. No longer in the 17s, uh, when the main purpose of trade agreements was to take down tariff walls. A modern trade agenda is about more than boosting economic exchanges and commercial opportunities. Modern trade is sustainable trade. Modern trade is sustainable trade. It's about ensuring high standards from social or environmental to health and safety. This is even more true 
with a very close, very close partner like the UK, with whom we should develop a common ambition. And how credible would we be going into the next COP26 meeting, for instance, in Glasgow, if uh, our future agreement allows businesses to cut corners on environmental and social rights for the sake of gaining market shares. Of course, we have heard Prime Minister Boris Johnson's assurances that the UK would never engage in a race to the bottom, that it would not seek to undermine European standards, that the UK would in fact maintain higher standards than the EU. And, to be frank, we are ready to believe this. In fact, I do not believe that the UK will become some sort of Singapore on Thames. But that means it should not be a problem for the UK to agree on a number of ground rules. And I want to be very, very clear. We understand that the UK wants its own rule book. We respect that choice the UK's sovereignty choice. That was the whole point of leaving the EU. However, there are not two ways about it. Every preferential, preferential trade agreement set terms and conditions for opening up markets. The logic is simple. If you are a member of the EU, you get frictionless access to a market of 450 million consumers. If you have no preferential trade agreement with the EU, you get access, like any third countries, under the standards of the WTO regime. And if you are somewhere in between, you get something in between. But there is no single template. There, were, there was never and there will never be a simple, a single template. The UK says it wants Canada, but the problem with that is that the UK is not Canada. Uh, let me just try to give the proof of uh, what I said with this slide showing the crossing between uh, the volume of the trade with many third countries and uh, the uh, proximity of the distance with these this, uh, third countries. A flight from Brussels to London takes 70 minutes. A flight from Brussels to Ottawa takes over 10 hours. EU 27 trade with Canada reached 55 billion euro in 2018. That sounds like a lot, but our trade with the UK was worth well over 500 billion euro, nearly 10 times more. And this slide is once again very clear. So, of course, our deals with Canada or with other countries give us reference points, but we need to tailor them to the reality of our relationships, and we always do with all our partners. Uh, dear friends and ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to offer to the UK super preferential access to our markets, a level of access that would be unprecedented for a third country, unprecedented. And this with a direct competitor that is right on our doorstep. Is this really something we can do without firm guarantees that the UK will respect the level playing field and avoid unfair competitive advantages? The answer, I am afraid, is simple. We cannot. We want competition in the future, but it must be fair, fair and free.
free and fair. That is why we are asking that the EU and the UK lay down together a number of rules building on our current high standards in specific areas. Stated environmental protection and the fight against climate change, social and labor rights, and taxation issues. This way, we will make sure that somewhere down the road, perhaps in years to come, neither side will use unfair subsidies, nor grant derogations on industrial emissions or on labor standards to win industries from the other. Because uh, this would not just create unfair competition, it would also cause damage to the environment and it would arm EU and UK workers. The simple fact is that a modern and sustainable trade policy requires ground rules. Dear friends, in the ongoing debate, the UK is insisting a lot on its own sovereignty, on its sovereign power to set its own rules for its own benefits, to define its own budget, to secure its own borders, to conclude its own trade deals, and to set its own standards. Let me, at this point, also be very, very clear. Nobody contests any of this. Nobody. Of course, we respect the UK's sovereignty. Of course, we respect its choices. But it is not just a point of philosophy. It is also a question of pragmatism. Firstly, because as of January 2021, there will be practical changes in every domain, as I said before. In very important areas, such as trade, transport, energy, and mutual security. Many of these changes will be mechanical, automatic, because of Brexit. So we will need to rebuild a relationship, one that is different to what we had done before, because the UK is no longer a member state. In this context, the more the UK seeks to distance itself from the common framework of rules we have built together during the last 47 years, over the years, the more our relationship will be distant across sectors. Secondly, it is a question of pragmatism, because international cooperation, whether economic or security uh, driven, is always based on a degree of rule sharing resource pooling, and common governance. This is not about giving up sovereignty. It is not about losing control. It is about using your sovereignty to further the interests of your country. During its uh, 47 years of membership, the UK built up a privileged position in a number of strategic areas. In great part, this was made possible by the fact that the UK was an EU member state within, within the single market. But the UK has decided to leave the single market, the customs union, and all the EU international agreements, 600 international agreements, mechanically, automatically. It no longer wishes to participate to our common ecosystem of rules, supervision, or enforcement mechanisms. This choice will have consequences as of the first 2021, even if we reach a deal with the UK on our relationship. And allow me to be more concrete, to give to you three concrete examples. First of all, regarding imports from the UK. On the 1st January 2021, whatever the outcome of the negotiation, there will be checks and controls on all UK goods entering the single market as they are for any third country. 
These checks are particularly important given the UK's position as a major entry point in the single market. And as part of these checks, we will need to pay the greatest, the greatest attention to the rules of origin that we will put in our trade agreement. Of course, of course, we love made in Britain, of course. But we must have guarantees that the goods we import from the UK, tariff and quota free, really are British. We cannot take the risk that the UK becomes a kind of assembly hub for goods from all over the world, allowing them to enter the single market as British goods. This is the first example. The second one is about financial services. As of the 1st January 2021, UK firms will lose the benefit of the financial services passport. Indeed, no firm from a country outside the single market has such a passport. This means that UK financial services firm will no longer be able to offer the services in all EU member states based on their UK authorizations. And those UK financial institutions that want to continue working in all certainty across the single market, now that they, are, they can establish themselves in one of the 27 EU member states, it is a possibility. For the rest, in a number of sectors, such as the area of credit rating agencies, the EU will have the possibility to grant equivalences. We will do so when it is in the interest of the EU, our financial stability, our investors, and our consumers. But these equivalences will never be global nor permanent, nor will they be subject to joint management with the UK. They are and will remain unilateral decisions. I read in the, the Financial Times uh, recently that London must retain its uh, uh, primacy as a hub for all sale financial markets without becoming a rule taker of the European Union and the European regulation. As a former commissioner in charge of financial services, allow me to question that. We should we accept that the profits stay in London while the EU carries the risks. Ladies and gentlemen, the UK may not want to be a rule taker, okay, but we do not want to be the risk taker. When the next financial crisis strikes, who will foot the bill? I doubt the UK will foot it for the EU. That is why the EU must take the responsibility for its financial regulation, supervision, and its financial stability. This is the second example. And the third and last one is about the authorization and certification of goods for circulation in the EU single market. As of the 1st January next year, as a third country, the UK will no longer be able to grant marketing authorizations for, for instance, pharmaceuticals or types approval for cars for the EU market. In other sectors, too, the EU cannot accept to be reliant on a third country that is no longer participating in the internal market for key regulatory, supervisory, and certification tasks tasks, especially when we are talking about very large volumes and even more so when we are talking about critical products such as medical devices. Aside from possible supply risks, this would raise enforcement issues. This is why this function must be carried out in the EU in the future. Voilà, je voudrais... So, I'll finish very shortly, and uh, I apologise for keeping your attention, but these are, of course, complex subjects and complex negotiations, of course. When I was preparing this speech, I was reminded of uh, something that Franklin Roosevelt, a very great president, said, which was... 
has been shown to be useful up to a certain point and no further, but cooperation, which is the thing we must try for today, begins where competition leaves off. Pour moi, chers amis, so for me, dear friends, there is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that what we need to do is rebuild an ambitious partnership with the United Kingdom. Regardless of our regrets of seeing the UK leave the EU, it remains there. It is near to us. It's a partner and a friend as well as an ally. And we need to build a partnership in so many areas very specific, uh, very tangible uh, areas for many European citizens, such as air uh, con connectivity. Uh, the UK is leaving the Single Skies Agreement, so we need a, a replacement for that. Of course, road freight transport as well, finding another way uh, than Euroton to cooperate in the peaceful use of nuclear energy, a second example there as well as establishing new arrangements to ensure the rights of mobility and residence of uh, both sets of citizens. And, of course, we'll be looking very closely at the new British immigration policy, which will be very different from it was before. Uh, and, of course, we will accept no, form, no discrimination in terms of our nationals. Now, I cited Roosevelt, I could have cited Churchill, um, by saying that cooperation it requires agreement on common rules. It needs a common and strong governance framework. It's true not just for the economy or for security, which of course are two pillars uh, of our future relationship. The, the world is changing very, very quickly and much quicker uh, than certain politicians believe. I think that the EU, as well as the UK, must continue to cooperate uh, on common challenges. Uh, sometimes we see them outside the EU, in Africa, in, in, in the Sahel, and sometimes within our democracies. We've seen it with uh, terrorism, with cyber attacks, organised crime, uh, money laundering, and... We need to find a way to work with the United Kingdom to find a common framework to ensure the security of our citizens. And there can be no trade-off between trade and security. The UK is a third country outside Schengen. It will no longer be affected by free movement of people, but we'll need to find new cooperation mechanisms on, again, very concrete examples such as extradition, uh, the the arrest warrant, p passenger data exchange and data protection, the sharing of sometimes very personal information such as DNA profiles. These are subjects that we need to discuss and we need to ensure that if we were to continue to to share data with the UK, that the European citizens' data would be uh, properly respected. We need to, in, and, and this can only happen if the UK continues to apply the European Convention on Human Rights, as well, of course, uh, continues to guarantee adequate data protection standards. For this, we also need to ensure there's a, an effective dispute resolution mechanism. This is it's extremely important for us to find cooperation in common security and foreign policy. The UK is a huge partner here in terms of dissuasive military might. The UK is also a huge player. So we have uh, myriad reasons to continue to work with the UK. Uh, we're ready to do so if the United Kingdom desires. Uh, but I do have one worry. Uh, the negotiations start next Monday, Monday afternoon. We'll open a, a dozen or so uh, negotiation tables to to discuss the various things in such a short time as, as Boris Johnson has discussed. And we see ministerial declarations coming out of the UK and we see a distancing in what's being said moving back from what was said in the political declaration and in the, in the withdrawal agreement where promises were made promises to cooperate with us uh, to make sure there's no form of unfair competition and our concern 
is that the text in the political direction, uh, declaration me- needs to be properly respected and implemented to the letter in a legal framework. Of course, we're determined to find uh, a good uh, agreement. Uh, our responsibility is to citizens and to businesses of the European Union. Uh, we are going to be very rational. We will keep our eyes open. Um, we'll see if there's a, an agreement at the end of the the end of the year and the changes which will take place. As I said, border control we could well be bolstered by other frictions, taxes and quotas, etc. Now, I just wanted to end with a more personal and less political uh, note. There's a reason for us to be together. Now, if we could just go back to the first slide. There we go. We'll have the first slide first and not, not both of them. Otherwise, the demonstration doesn't work. So, uh, Now, the slide's got a story behind it. It was David Cameron who published this. I'm sure you remember him. Now, when I was Commissioner for the Internal Market, he published a document to show the importance of being together rather than being alone. And it was to support my work on the single market. And this is the updated slide now, which shows one thing. Individually, countries are simply pushed off the table and I've used this data to show what happens when we stay together supporting the single market, which, of course, is the starting block for everything, and then what happens when we are alone. Dear friends, remember what I'm saying, which is the, the geo-economic, geopolitical context in which Brexit is happening, and this is where the British have chosen to be alone rather than be together. And if we think about it now, I'm convinced for France, for Germany for all countries, if you're pushed off the table where all the other big countries, we say emerging countries, but of course one moment they will emerge or another, and simply because they are so big, they're so populous, they have so many natural resources, they are at the table. And if we want to stay at the table, and even here you see that that that's not certain, but if we want to stay at the table, we have to remain together. We have to remain together as European patriots if we want to defend our values, if we want to make sure that we are deciding in the order of the world, we need to remain together. Otherwise, we are simply uh, stripped of influence and any say. And I say this to make sure that my country and the continent uh, that we're on does not end up in that situation. I hope I've been clear I saw a, a drawing in the newspaper Le Monde the other day, and I think you can see it here on the screen. And I don't think Planty was particularly right, um, but there we go. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Yeah, Dear Michel, uh, what, a, what a fantastic masterclass for our ESCP uh, students. Thank you for explaining the context, explaining the transition phase of only 12, uh, 10 months now, and also for explaining how we need to be uh, getting prepared as a uh, EU citizens for an ambitious partnership, you said, with fair and free competition. Before we get into the uh, Dr. Honoris Causa ceremony, there will be now a phase of uh, questions. I know that Michel loves this uh, interaction um, with you, with uh, students, and it's going to be led by uh, Yves, Yves Tancini, who's been uh, coordinating this seminar outstandingly. Thank you, Yves. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, 
Thank you all. Thank you, Michel Barnier, for this uh, presentation. We have given the time frame some questions from the audience accepted. Uh, so I, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, the volunteer to ask a question, to raise your hand, and then I'm going to pick the volunteers. And once I will pick the volunteer, I will ask him or her to stand up so that the microphone can be open and the questions expressed. So, I mean, the first one, the bravest one, this one, yes, please stand up. No, I will take three questions, please. So, three questions, okay. Center, right and left. So please stand up, number 449. Sorry, I don't call your name. And please ask your question. You have one minute maximum. It's a question. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Barnier, for being here. First, I think I speak on behalf of every ESCP student uh, today. I was just wondering if during your negotiations um, with the parties... Tell, tell me, who are, who, who are you? Yes, yeah, sorry. Let me maybe briefly introduce myself. My name is Nathan Simoni. Uh, I'm an ESCP student, uh, uh, M1 student at ESCP. And um, I was just wondering if there was something, maybe that struck you or surprised you, maybe in a good way, in the negotiation that you held, something that you didn't expect during the negotiation you had with the UK Paris. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Then the second question from the left side, please. The same, give your name. And go ahead. Cool. Hello, Mr. Barnier. My name is Oscar. I'm a M1 student at ESCP. Um, you mentioned the fact that, um, in your opinion, the British government is, distanci is, is um, distanciating from, um, from uh, the agreement you led under the EU mandate, especially on the um, Irish um, uh, subject. And I would like to ask you, um, do you believe it is likely that um, um, a, a united Ireland, uh, like a referendum, could happen in the following years, and that Northern Ireland might, might, might rejoin the uh, EU throughout a uh, united Ireland. Thank you. Well, then a third question from the right side, and then we'll have a last one in the centre again. No lady at this stage. Go ahead, please, number, I mean, I hope they see you because it's difficult to be seen from here. Please go ahead. Okay, dear, sorry. Sorry, it's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, sorry. Uh, dear, this, dear Mr. Bernier, thank you very much for your speech. I want to thank you for all the ESCP students. And I would like just to ask you a question. I don't want to be too, too long, uh, the, the answer, of course, because it's a difficult one, maybe. But I want to ask you, between the 1973, uh, when the Britain and the UK joined the EU, uh, with also your uh, co collaboration uh, throughout the, the process, and what you think, something like three examples of what changes between uh, what had changed between then and now, and 2016, of course, the Brexit uh, and uh, the EU leaving our uh, our uh, European Union. Can you can you please rephrase. could you please elaborate a bit more or rephrase your question? <laughs> okay, I know I know it's a, it's a difficult one. I will I will just me, like to ask uh, three name. things that you think that changed between 1973 
and uh, 2016. So what brought United Kingdom to leave the European Union on a um, macro, uh, yes, on a bigger, uh, bigger picture aspect, on the world picture aspect? This is done. Okay. We got it. Last but not least, please. Sorry? How does it work? Oh. Hello. So my name is Jack. Thank you for your speech. I'm from ESCP. Uh, obviously, first, uh, first year. I want to ask a question about the contribution. Obviously, one big problem is when the UK is going to leave the European Union, there's going to have a big problem of contribution for the European Union. So my question is, uh, let's say uh, you impose a tax that is over four years of budget of the UK. How are you going to contribute the gap for the revenue of the EU after that? What's your plan to do so after they have contributed for the next four years of their budget? What happens next? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Barnier, four questions and then four answers expected. Good luck. Um, so, uh, I will try to answer telegraphically to each of these questions. Um, I will be very brief on the second one, Oscar. Where are you? Uh, because um, I, I, I always listen to everybody, not only from Northern Ireland, but also uh, from Scotland. I met uh, last Monday the, the First Minister of Scotland in my office. Um, but I cannot, I do not want to intervene in the national debate of the UK. So you cannot ask to me and question about what could be uh, the evolution in the UK debate. I don't want to intervene. I don't want to be um, um, involved in uh, any national debate. I respect the UK. We negotiate with the UK government only. I listen to everybody. But I don't want to, 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 in, to, to be involved in uh, the national debates. And uh, as far as Ireland is concerned, uh, my only goal has been and will remain to find the way, and we have found a way with uh, Boris Johnson in this, in this agreement, to uh, 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 solve the cycles, if I, if I may say, the, 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 the four issues we have to solve in the same time, uh, all around the whole island economy, no border, uh, integrity of the custom union of the UK, and uh, uh, no border. Huh? So, so, and uh, we always worked and we found this solution respecting uh, the, the institutional order of the UK. And we, I will continue. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, I don't want to, to intervene. Uh, uh, the budget, uh, uh, the, the, the UK, until the beginning and uh, uh, until the, uh, since the beginning until the, the end of this year, is and has been a, con a net contributor, 10 billion per year. That means that uh, starting from the next pluriannual perspective, beginning next year, the UK is no longer there. We have to find uh, a way to cover this budget. It's not a, it's, it's one, one, one percent of the GDP. Huh? It's many billions, but uh, it's only one percent. Uh, we have to cover the, the, the needs to finance the policies, e even the new policies in, in this framework, and there is a huge and very difficult debate. Um, probably, obviously, this, this debate is a little bit more difficult this year because the UK is no longer there. But uh, if I speak frankly with you, this debate has never been easy, never. And if you look at the newspaper seven years ago, it was exactly the same kind of a, a huge and, and conflict and, uh, and difficulty between the, the net contributors and the net beneficiaries and so so. so uh, but the gap is this one, 10 billion per year. Huh? So I think that the Commission is working on. We have to convince the member state step by step to... to to, to, to face all the, these, these policies and to finance these policies um, and also uh, perhaps to change the structure itself of the budget. 
uh, with a new proper resources. Uh, this is the, the challenge today. Um, what what changes that can, can explain um, what happened in the UK? Um, it, it's, it's clear that the UK joined uh, 47 years ago, not really for the same reasons that the founding, founding countries. Huh? Uh, they, they, they joined, if I remember clearly the speeches of the Prime Minister at that, at that moment, uh, for economic and trade um, reasons. It was the main reason to join the single market, at that, the common market at that time, and to trade with us more easily. Okay. Uh, but for us, perhaps not for all the UK leaders, uh, the EU is not only a, a supermarket. Uh, um, the supermarket is much more than the market or free trade zone. With the UK, we have built along this period a real, uh, what I can call, an ecosystem between the 28 member states, uh, which is much more than a uh, free trade zone. Uh, common standards, common norms, common rights for the consumers, common regulations, common supervision, and on top of everything, a common jurisdiction, the Court of Justice. This is a single market. And it is reason why, the main reason why Mr. Trump, on one side, or the Chinese president, respect us. Because a Chinese firm or a U.S. companies entering in Slovenia or in France or in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, respecting the rules, the standards, uh, accepting the supervision, the regulations, the rules of the Court of Justice, if these conditions are reached, this firm, Chinese or U.S., enter in a, in a market of 400 or, f until now, 500 million consumers immediately, automatically. This is our main asset. This is the reason why uh, we never accepted to, 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 to negotiate or to compromise on the single market. And we will never do that, never. We will never accept to unravel or fragilize the single market, never. Uh, the single market is not for negotiation. Huh? So, so uh, having been saying that, um, uh, if you look at the reasons of the, the Brexit, uh, there are obviously specific British reasons, as we can find in France, for instance, specific French uh, reasons if you listen to the sovereignist uh, on the left side, Mr. Mélenchon, or on the right side, uh, Mrs. Le Pen. Uh, but if I may, this question, this question is very important. Um, apart from the very specific British reasons, uh, there are um, a common popular sentiment, a popular feeling in the many British regions, the Midlands and some others, where uh, what is behind the Brexit is a social anger, if I speak frankly. The feeling that the EU does not protect the citizens, uh, the feeling of abandon, to be abandoned, uh, face the globalizations. Uh, and my, my as a politician, my, my, my recommendation is about the consequences of the Brexit and we try to deal with the consequences. We have to take the time to listen, to understand, and to answer to this popular feeling. It's too late for the British regions. It's not too late for the European regions. Where you find today exactly the same popular sentiment. And don't confuse the popular sentiment with the, with the populism. The populism used uh, use, uh, the, 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 the social anger. So we have to answer. And to be more optimistic, there, there, there are solutions. There are answers at the local level, 
for agriculture, for the public services, for the public health, for the transportation, at the national level, for the, to have a, an industrial ambition, and at the European level. And what is uh, clear that the new president of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in, in the, 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 her first decisions has understood that we have to answer. This is my, my, my answer to the questions. Um, what has created some surprise, um, the, 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 the terms of the Brexit was, were very clear from the very beginning. Huh? Uh, they want to leave, okay. Uh, a surprise was the fact that uh, the Prime Minister was not able to reach a majority in, to, 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 to get uh, it, the, the vote three times of it, our own majority before uh, the election of Boris Johnson. It, is, it was a surprise for us. Um, a surprise, uh, not so much, but uh, reality is also uh, the, the, the very end of my meeting with Mr. Farage. I just want to, uh, to tell you uh, what was at that time my, first, my, my last question to Mr. Farage as his answer. At the end of this meeting, once again, it's very stimulating, uh, I asked to Mr. Farage, uh, you, 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 you were on the front line of the Brexit campaign, you want to get Brexit okay, we are going to deliver the Brexit, okay. Uh, what is, Mr. Farage, your vision? How do you see, after the Brexit, the relation between the EU and the UK? What is your vision? And his answer was very clear and immediate. Mr. Barnier, after the Brexit, the EU will no longer exist. Uh, so that means that the, this leader and some others want to destroy us. I'm not speaking of the current British government. I'm speaking of a certain number of people behind the Brexit campaign. They want to destroy the EU, and we are not obliged to give them the point. So we have to react, as I answered to the previous questions, and we have to, to be careful and to protect ourselves also. So uh, today, <clears throat> I have not yet surprised, perhaps a, a point of concern, which is uh, the distance that... Uh, uh, the British government want to put between its previous uh, commitments with us and the current uh, speeches on the political declarations and uh, on uh, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. But we have to check this point in the next few days and weeks. It's, it's over? Yes. No? We have to respect the time. So, thank you very much.